thanks to Michael and to everybody at Yale for this uh, kind invitation. Um, it was a great pleasure to visit um, Beinecke in 2017 to conduct research on Richard Wright's photographs. Um, these days, it's widely known that in the summer of 1953, Richard Wright, who was by any stretch of the imagination, the most renowned African-American novelist in the world, traveled to the African continent for the first time. For 10 weeks, Richard Wright traveled through the Gold Coast, where he witnessed Kwame Nkrumah's convention, People's Party, West Africa's first mass socialist party, as it campaigned for independence from the district. Before Wright published Black Power, a record of reactions in a land of pathos. And so Wright spent 10 weeks in the Gold Coast. He left Liverpool in June of 53, boarded the ship Accra. He arrived in Takaradi on the 14th of June. His immediate reason for visiting the Gold Coast for the first time was to attend the Legislative Assembly, where Prime Minister Kwame Nkrumah was to propose the so-called motion of destiny for the independence of the Gold Coast from the British Empire. In order to fully grasp the implications of the Gold Coast revolution, Richard Wright undertook an ambitious journey throughout the colony, traveling from Accra in the south to Tomati in the center and Samraboy in the north. On 2nd of September 1953, Wright left Takradi on the ship Papa. He returned to Paris with his 1,000 page account of his 10 weeks in the Gold Coast, which he called Pathos of Distance a term he drew from Nietzsche's genealogy of morals. Papers of Distance was more than a travel journal. That's how it's named in the Beinecke Library, travel journal. But it was more than that. I think, in fact, it was more than a first draft of what would become Black Power. In its insights, the account African emancipation in the Gold Coast actually surpasses Black Power, a record of reactions in the land of pathos. It deserves publication in its own right. And um, I would really be, I've thought a lot about that manuscript. It's an overwhelming, powerful, work of writing. Um, it bears equal, if not parallel weight as those other two significant works of the era, Franz Fanon's Black Skin, White Mask and Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man, as a work of psychopolitics. Now, when Black Power a record of reaction in a land of pathos was finally published in September 1954 after several rewritings. Wright's account of the alienation that he experienced in the Gold Coast challenged readers who were expecting an ode that sutured the political ontological, social, and aesthetic divergence, gap, or rift, and how you name that divergence is important. But readers were expecting an ode to a certain notion of return, or homecoming, or motherland. What they got instead was a much more complex, conflicted, and internally contested work that has influenced 
several subsequent generations of diasporic intellectuals in the continent, in the US, in the UK, in Europe, and the Caribbean, that have journeyed to Ghana since then and have found themselves face to face with the question posed by Wright in 54. That means we could draw a line from Wright in 54 to Sadia Harpens Lose Your Mother in 2007. It's quite possible to see the same confrontation with the dilemmas of diasporicity, to think through the relation between certain kinds of disenchantment and disillusion. Um, there's, a, there's a request that I speak a bit louder. Now, one of the reasons I was at Beinecke is that few of Richard Wright's readers in 1954 or subsequently realized that Wright had shot more than 600 photographs with his Rolleiflex and his contacts cameras as he traveled throughout the Gold Coast. Wright had intended Black Power to be a photo text in which images played an equal role with words, but not identical to 12 million Black voices, his earlier photo text, but also not unrelated to that earlier project. But much to Richard Wright's disappointment, only 14 of his photographs, several of which he had already captioned in preparation for the publication of Black Power. Only 14 of those photographs were printed. After Wright's death in Paris in 1960, his widow, Ellen Wright, deposited those 600 photographic prints and 49 contact sheets at the Beinecke Rare Book and Manuscript Library at Yale. Beyond the academic community has access to those prints and those content sheets. You in Ghana or in different parts of the continent or in the Caribbean, or the UK, or Europe, or the US have had the opportunity to view those photographs. Part of the project that I embarked on with Angelica Saga of the Ottawa Group was to return to this archive, this unseen archive, in order to compose new relations between those unseen, those largely unseen photographs and the historical text of Black Power. Part of what was at stake was finding a means and a method for drawing out the unease and the disquiet experienced by Richard Wright in the Gold Coast. What Wright found as he journeyed throughout was a certain distance and a certain distrust that he encountered from members of the CPP, but also from Nkrumah's opponents and also from the British who were still very much present in the Gold Coast and the Americans. What Wright encountered, in other words, was the Gold Coast as a key hub in a global Cold War, in which the watchful eyes and undeclared affiliations of different stakeholders in that Cold War spoke of the trepidations 
of what political scientists were already calling political transfer. That's to say the process of what was called institutional political transfer from the British Empire to what would become Ghana and to what was not yet a republic meant that Wright found himself caught up in a in something like a crossfire of glances. So, if you will, imagine Richard Wright, picture him, a 44-year-old novelist, an ex-communist, a public intellectual, a man in a suit, in several suits, with two expensive cameras, on the move between Gold Coast activists, American diplomats, British civil servants. What kind of photograph such a person take? What scenes? What sights? What gestures? What expressions would catch his eye? If he were to direct a film, what kind of film would he be making? Richard Wright, like all the intellectuals of his generation, was fascinated by cinema, wrote, acted, of course, in his own version of Native Son, filmed in Argentina. If Richard Wright were to direct a film, what kind of film would he make? And who would he cast? So the project that the Ottomans group embarked on tried to imagine a drama in which the photographs themselves are the actors and the extras in a world in which images would have to be understood at one and the same time as evidence, as exploration, as encounter, and as expressionism. So there is a work that the Otis group completed a work called The Nucleus of the Great Union. And uh, I'm not going to play that work now because Zoom does not handle moving images very well, as I've found to my cost. But those who would be interested in seeing such a film, please get in touch. And we'll find a way to share that. Instead, I want you to hold that thought and draw it into relation with another set of preoccupations. A set of preoccupations that try to draw out what it means or one way of thinking about Richard Wright during the gold, during the Cold War and try to situate his relations to the Gold Coast within that global Cold War. So that means transitioning from a moment in 2017 to an exhibition held in 2018 at the House of World Cultures called Parapolitics. And this exhibition tried to think through the relation of Richard Wright to the so-called cultural Cold War. That's to say, it tried to think through the relation of the so-called Congress for Cultural Freedom in relation to Richard Wright. And so what I want to do is to try to draw out Richard Wright as a figure encountering the global Cold War in the Gold Coast to a figure who moved between the overlapping worlds of 
anti-colonial, anti-capitalist, anti-communism. Richard Wright as a figure negotiating and navigating three positions simultaneously. Such that his moment in the Gold Coast becomes one example of that negotiation played out in those later books, which I find to be extremely compelling and important and innovatory works. I'm talking about The Color Curtain, I'm talking about Pagan Spain, I'm talking about White Man Listen, and Black Power to me is part of those four works, which I think form a profound quartet of works. I had the pleasure of reading Pagan Spain recently. And uh, these works, I think, really indicate part of Wright's project to move between these conflicting to try to bridge my opening section to this um, broader broader understanding. So let's put it this way. Returning to Richard Wright's work today requires a reading practice which attends to the rhetorical guarantees invoked by terms such as freedom, totalitarianism, the Negro, containment, communism, anti-communism, Africa, redemption, the African personality, the Cold War. These words are not so much concepts or metaphors, but attempts to conduct political struggles over meaning struggles conducted in the polemical idioms of the era. Paul Gilroy perceptively describes Richard Wright's political position as combining a fervent anti-communism with a passionate anti-capitalism. That's correct, but what it misses is a third element that mediates between the former and the latter. That third element is rights concern with anti-colonialism. The question then would be, what kind of anti-colonialism did Richard Wright espouse? How did, how did his anti-colonialism relate to his ongoing critique of capitalism? Uh, How in turn did these positions relate to the wider forms of anti-communism that sought to dominate the global Cold War? So what we have to account for is Richard Wright's conflicted anti-communism, his atheistic anti-colonialism, and his diagnostic anti-capitalism. What we have to do is situate these perspectives in relation to the writings that he published in journals that were funded by the Congress for Cultural Freedom between 1953 and 1958, which are the periods of time, of course, in which he's traveling to the Gold Coast, traveling to Bandung in Indonesia, for that first an Asian African conference, the same time he travels to Spain. It's the time in which his travels through Scandinavia and Germany yields the texts that will be published in White Man Listen. It's the time of the, the key congress of Negro African writers of which he plays a critical role. It's the same era 
1956, in which Amos Desai resigns from the Communist Party. Uh, so this is the milieu within which intersection in which, which details in close detail every encounter which might have had with and in order to understand this project we also need to understand the very notion of this tcf itself congress for cultural freedom and we have to pit that against his relation to his friend george padman in 56, George Patton wrote the pivotal text, Pan Africanism and Communism, The Coming Struggle for Africa. Richard Wright wrote the introduction to that text. Indeed, Black Power itself begins in Mornington Crescent in North London with Dorothy Patton, who, as George Patton was wife and partner collaborated with him closely, typed his texts, and in the case of Africa, Britain's third empire, collaborated in the production of that text. So had had more and right but being close. Um, the letters exchanged between Dorothy Padmore and Ellen Wright are deeply compelling. Um, the letters between Padmore and Wright itself are extremely powerful. And that's another volume that deserves publication. So in order to understand what the CCF is and what Richard Wright's collaboration is, we need to understand the two notions of the non-communist left, the anti-communist left and how Richard Wright positioned himself in relation to these two notions. And indeed, we need to understand what these terms even mean. What we could say was that the leading intellectuals of the Congress for Cultural Freedom struggle to differentiate their project of so-called the so-called non-communist left from the right-wing anti-communism championed by Senator Joseph McCartney throughout the 50s. So we have to reconstruct the ideological formation of the non-communist left in the early years of the Cold War in order to understand how right was the, the earliest and most significant African-American writer recruited by the non-communist left as a kind of morally preeminent figure. And to do this, we have to go to um, the writings of Arthur M. Lettinger Jr., who isn't read so much now, but who in 1949 published a text called The Vital Center, The Politics of Freedom. This is the text that characterizes what was understood as the non-communist left. The non-communist left are the, the matrix of ex-communists who wish to draw right into their circle. So Schlesinger argued that there was a functional equivalence between fascism and communism, which required critics to rethink the vocabulary inherited from the spirit of the American and French revolutions. The rise of fascism and communism, he believed, meant that in certain respects, the totalitarian state, single party, the leader, the secret police, fascism and communism are more like each other than they are like anything. So what Schlesinger argued was that there was no, there was not a line between the left and the right, but a circle in which fascism and communism meet at the bottom. There was a circle. And in this circle, uh, 
Back of them on the moderate right are side by side against communism and the moderate left. The moderate right and the moderate left are side by side against fascism and against communism. And so this idea, and so Schlesinger diagrams this notion in which he tried to reformulate the idea of left versus right in terms that corresponded to what he called the complexities of this ghastly center. What the vital center actually did was to create a functionalist analogy that erased capitalist imperialism, systematic exploitation of the dependent territories, such as the Gold Coast or Indonesia, from the political imagination of the Cold War. The idea was to make it impossible to foreclose the understanding and the comprehension of what George Padmore, the Trinidadian Marxist theorist, the, the mentor of Kwame Nkrumah, called colonial fascism that was perpetrated by the imperial powers throughout Africa and Asia. Had more, like right, had been a communist. He was a former editor for the Negro Worker in Harlem. Unlike, sorry, in the, in, in, the, in the USSR, unlike right, Hadmore had worked with and for the Communist International in Moscow from 1930 until his break with the party in 1933. So Hadmore's anti-imperialist, anti-communism expressed in his development of the theory and practice of Pan-African socialism in books that began with how Britain ruled Africa and concluded with Pan-Africanism or communism, the coming struggle for Africa that informed Wright's own thinking and provided Wright with a political vocabulary for fashioning an anti-capitalist, anti-colonial, anti-communist perspective that cut across the imperialist legitimation celebrated by Schlesinger Jr. in the vital center. So in the foreword to Pan-Africanism or Communism, Wright sought to clarify Padmore's anti-Stalinism from that of the non-communist left. And in doing so, to clear a space for his own thinking. So this is Richard Wright. When George Padmore discovered that beyond doubt, Stalin and his satraps looked upon black men as political pawns of Soviet power politics to be maneuvered in Russian interest alone. He broke completely with the Kremlin. And then in capital letters, Richard Wright, Richard Wright writes the following words, but his breaking did not mean that he then automatically supported the enemies of the Soviet Union. And his refusal to support the enemies of the Soviet Union was not dictated by any love for Stalin. No, with a big exclamation mark. No, writes Richard Wright. He continued his work alone, striving to achieve through his own instrumentality that which he had worked for when he was in the Comintern hierarchy. That is, freedom for black people. So what Wright is arguing is the F Wright is arguing for the autonomy of black internationalist struggles from within the global Cold War. And what those capital letters point to is the effort required to clear a space for Padmore's anti-colonial program of Pan-Africanist socialism, which required it to be differentiated from the automatic assumption 
that anti-Stalinism entailed a support for capitalist imperialism and the equally wide held belief that anti-capitalism presupposes a support for Stalinism. These assumptions popularized by the non-communist left promoted by Schlesinger in a book like The Vital Center effectively worked to exclude Pan-Africanism's anti-colonial anti-capitalism from the political imagination of the global Cold War. What this means is that from 53, right the way through to his death in 1960, Richard Wright's essays, his articles and his books from Black Power onwards, aim to expand the political imagination of African, Asian and Black American autonomy beyond the limits to the imagination promoted by the so-called white that's part of the project of Richard Wright. That's what is crucial to grasp about his, about his anti-colonial, anti-capitalist, anti-communist. Now, I have a long section which I'm going to cut to. I'm going to cut right to the end and draw the conclusion based on Richard Wright's final speech which is only available to this day at the final. Since uh, the final key of extended this invitation, it makes sense to, to highlight this moment in my text, which is the kind of concluding section of this moment. So I'll cut out the time in a second. But there is a relation between Wright's position in 1956, Wright's position in the Gold Coast in 1953, and Wright's position in the final year of his life in 1950. So what I've tried to do is sketch out three brief moments, 1953, 1956, and now 1960. So in Wright's final public lecture, the position of the Negro intellectual in American society, another text that requires publication, delivered at the American church in Paris on 8th November 1960, 10 days before his death, Wright carefully articulated the literary, political and psychological implications of the gulf between Cold War ideals of democracy or justice or progress and their insufficiency when those ideals confront the existence of America's 12 million Black audience. What Wright wanted to grasp was the extent to which the Negro represents a paradox, that's his phrase. Though he is an organic part of the nation, he is excluded by the entire tide and direction of American culture. Frankly, it is felt to be right to exclude him, and it is felt to be wrong to admit him freely. What Richard Wright grasped from his position in Paris was that American capitalism's attachment to tethering and banishing the Negro to and from the body politic of the USA continued the logic of exclusion and inclusion pioneered by 19th century imperialism's international law. That's to say the native subjects contained by imperialism within Africa the Caribbean, Asia, and South America were subject to similar conditions as Americans in the 20th century who were excluded from the full rights of membership while they remained subject to the obligations of inclusion. And this double inscription of exclusion from rights of membership 
to being subject to the obligations of inclusion operated at the scale of the international and the so-called domestic. So what it's possible to see, and this is I owe to the work of uh, the writer Nicole Walegora Davis, that Richard Wright's exile, voluntary exile in Paris after 1947, brings home to him the extent to which the geographical distance between himself and the United States pales in comparison to the state-supported gulf dividing Black people and the larger U.S. policy. That's Malagora Davis. And this is right. This is his key formulation in his the position of the Negro intellectual in American society. The values of democracy, justice, progress, and religion are not realities that we can take for granted. The distance that separates the Negro from these values resulted for right in a disenchantment towards the signifier of freedom on what it was supposed to signify. That to say freedom failed to signify for Black American intellectuals and Black Americans in general, as it did for the Congress for Cultural Freedom. Wright's understanding of the non-communist left allowed him to interpret the failed performativity of freedom in ways that eluded the notion of a vital center. What Wright understood that, what Wright understood was that the term such as democracy is not something that we know about or have lived, but a value which we are trying to wring in the form of concessions from reluctant and grudging whites. Justice is not a clear cut concept for us, but something that we are trying to make whites let us share. An amazing and profound insight. For Black Americans, right today, democracy's history as a value has proven itself to be unreliable, capricious untrustworthy and treacherous. Wright emphasizes that, quote, our inability to assume that these values will or can work depends upon the whims or moods or laws of the white men who rule the Western world. To his audience on that night, in Paris in 1960, what Wright articulated was Black Americans' long-standing lack of faith in the value of such ideals. And this loss of faith, faith, this faithlessness was based on an intimate acquaintance with the discrepant histories of those ideals and those values. Wright's painful insight into Black people's intimacy with the lawlessness that called itself the law undermined the Congress for Cultural Freedom's efforts to treat democracy or freedom as a standard that could command automatic allegiance. Wright's arguments influenced his friend, Simone de Beauvoir. In 1950, her text, America Day by Day, developed these arguments on the paradox of inclusive exclusion. But Simone de Beauvoir comes to America on a university tour and is struck by white capitalism's persistent attachment to criminal impunity licensed illegality, both of which exposed the lies of Black Americans to arbitrary 
danger. So drawing explicitly on Richard Wright, the Beauvoir asserted that, quote, the democratic character of the American judicial system in which judges and the police are often elected can be a good thing in a homogenous society, but it becomes a grave danger to democracy in a society in which political participation is restrained and in which one caste traditionally oppresses another. Under the racial caste system of the US, what Beauvoir saw was, quote, the minority without political power finds itself defenseless in the face of the court and the police. The result is that the black man is constantly in danger from white. The Beauvoir's attention to the ongoing histories of white juridical endangerment drew directly on Richard Wright's own thinking. So I'm going to cut one section now and then conclude. Wright, by 1960, Wright had come to the realization earlier than most that the Congress for Cultural Freedom's secretive funding structure entailed state support, as was later the case, of course, as was revealed in 67 as CIA support, in fact, famously so. Wright's insight into a secretive funding structure of the CCF, his suspicion, combined with his sensitivity to the US state's ongoing surveillance of his daily life in Paris, led him to develop a vocabulary attuned to widening levels of national deception, international duplicity, and global stimulation. He argued that the Americans now do all of their important work through the non-communist left, which operates through an anti-communist left, which they have bought and which they control. And so this is Richard Wright's diagram for understanding the political geography of the global Cold War at the start of the 1960s a world in which the autonomy of decolonization struggles to operate within and beyond the flexible apparatus of containment, that's, that's the American term, mobilized by the US national security state. What Wright saw was that government-sponsored revolutionary movements could reposition the non-communist left and the anti-communist left as variations of neo-colonialism. And to conclude, Wright draws his final moment from the position of the Negro artist and intellectual in society with a paraphrase from Shakespeare's Macbeth, a paraphrase that offers a final fatal political diagram for comprehending the confounding contestations and unwitting convergences between competing anti-colonialisms, contending anti-capitalisms, and conflicting anti-communisms. Richard Wright differentiated his own position from each of these perspectives by turning to Macbeth's despairing account of the intrigues and machinations of statecraft. All of these efforts appeared in the light of Lady Macbeth's suicide to have been futile, little more than a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury. In November 1960, the global Cold War appeared to Richard Wright as a bifurcated world of arcana imperi, in which the mysteries of government legitimized powerful foundations which claimed to be beyond the state, 
and outside the market, which claimed to enlist black artists and intellectuals into prestigious networks that in actuality compromised their ideals, corrupted their promise, and conscripted their values. What Richard White discerned was a cold, contained, occluded world, encapsulated in its most concentrated form as what Wright called a tale told by betrayers, full of double crossing, signifying defeat. Mm -hmm. 